I'm Liz hirschgoff tolly and welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection podcast. And on our podcast, we are meeting with elected leaders to talk about heart and humanity, not about politics and policy. So many times people are so quick to just say someone's a politician or there's a cutout. And what I've learned and what I want to share through this podcast is the beauty and the heart of our leaders. Uh, today we have a very special person. She is a senator from New York. And as a way of introducing her, I did a little research. And what I learned was as a young person, she was the number one seller of Girl Scout cookies, which is pretty impressive because there are a lot of competition. Yes. And what I also learned, just to give a little reference, because I got a little bit interested in this, which was that Girl Scout cookies started selling in 1917. And there's 1.7 million Girl Scouts right now. And they only do the sales for six to eight weeks, January through April. And they make $800 million a year in sales, which I thought was pretty interesting. And that people like Taylor Swift, Mariah Carey, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, Dakota Fanning, uh, Venus and Serena Williams, all fellow Girl Scout alums. Mm. So anyways, and what I really liked about the Girl Scouts was this whole concept of earn and learn. So you work hard, but you also learn how to do the work and that the money then helps Girl Scouts do projects that are important. So even though that is just an interesting way of introducing uh, Senator Gillibrand, I thought it was a nice way to like kind of celebrate a, an institution, an organization in our country that is doing good work. Yeah, very much so. And it's a great way for girls to learn about money, um, to actually have some awareness of how to make money, how much your product costs, how much you're selling it for, how you make profit. It teaches them basic financial literacy. It teaches them independence. Um, some of my really high sale, high, high sale years were because I went door to door and sold it in neighborhoods that I selected because they had lots of houses close together. Right. Um, you know, you didn't have to I, to I remember sitting up a little table at a local mall <laughs> and selling at the mall. Um, I remember selling at my mother's law office. I remember selling to any place where I thought people would go. And so it makes women think in an entrepreneurial way. And it just allows them to imagine themselves in a professional context when they're young. Yeah. And one of the things that they said was, what you do for your family and your community, you do for the world. Because the world is, after all, made up of families and communities like yours. So I love that also concept of, like, we're in this together. Like, I know you have an individual desire to be the best, but you really... Well, we didn't really compete with each other. We just knew our job was to sell a lot of cookies. Okay. So I never knew where the other girls were or cared. Yeah. But um, I just happened to sell the most cookies all the time. So I really, Well, I'm not surprised. So I really liked it. It was okay. just fun, and it was something fun to do on weekends. And <clears throat> I liked earning badges, and I liked my troop. And it was just a great, great way to, to meet kids and to have fun. And you brought up your mom's law office. And one of the things that I noticed is that you really have, you come from strong women your grandmother, your mother. Can you talk a little bit about like your relationship with your grandmothers um, and what they instilled in you and part of, I think, why you're a strong leader today because it's evident mm -hmm. that it comes that way. <clears throat> so my grandmother on my mother's side was the one who worked in politics. She was a secretary in the state legislature um, since the time she was about 18 years old. Yeah, And she recognized that very few women were elected and mostly were support staff for men. And so she recognized the quickest way to have a say or to have an impact was to get involved in politics and elect candidates that shared their values and shared their priorities and really allowed them to feel that they could have an impact on their communities wider than themselves. And so my first campaign activities were with my grandmother, stuffing envelopes, going door to door, going to events, going to rallies, um, going to vote. Uh, and I really admired her because this was how she exerted her influence over her community in a positive way. My other grandmother um, didn't go to college until she was, I think, in her 50s or 60s. And so I just remember spending time with her and she had such a love of learning and was always asking me about my classes and school and how I was doing. So she was very, very much dedicated to my education and and the benefits of, of generations of women who came after her, that they could get a college degree, they, they could get a professional degree, that they could um, work outside the home. And she really, she admired that about um, her granddaughters and um, the generations that came after her. Yeah. 
And you think about like what they, the seeds they laid for you and now the seeds you lay for the next generations. And that's sort of what we all are trying to do uh, for boys and girls, but, mm -hmm. you know, especially for women to find their place in, in, in power and in leadership. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I, I, I see you went to Emma Willard School mm -hmm. and it was boarding school. And did you have a special teachers or somebody that kind of like gave you some motivation that you carry with you through this day? Well, one of my favorite teachers was my social studies teacher. And she really inspired me to be curious about the world. She taught us how to read a newspaper, how to read the New York Times and what, you know, how it was set up and what sections you wanted to read if you wanted international news or if you wanted domestic news or if you wanted local news. And she had such a fascination with the world and what was happening. She instilled that in, in all of us. What was her name? Mrs. Handelman, yeah. Marsha Handelman. Yeah. And when I ran for Congress, she'd send me notes in the mail and, and encouraged me. And she actually winded up doing one of my first campaign commercials uh, for my first house race. Yeah. Really somebody that was in your life influential. Yeah. That's great. And then a little bit more, which is, you said that you studied a lot in high school and you didn't really do a lot of fun things or am I wrong? I mean, like, was, was, was it a lot you, of fun things? You did. So at that I, point, I studied a lot, not in high school because high school wasn't hard, but I studied more in college. I started a lot in law school, um, but I was in charge of the weekend activities. committee, So my job was to plan all the parties. Oh, so I had a great deal of fun. Okay, yes. good, 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 good. And then what is your, what was the, you learned Chinese. In college, I was an Asian studies major, and I learned Mandarin um, as part of that major. And I went to study in Beijing for three months, and then I traveled around China uh, for about a month and went to Tibet. And then I spent another three months studying in Taiwan. It's interesting. And that had no, you had no idea you were going to be a leader at that point. Yeah. And um, for my senior year, I was a um, fellow, and I got to write a year-long paper and study something in depth. And because of my interest in China and having studied there, lived there and traveled to Tibet, I wrote about the relationship between China and Tibet. And I got to go to India to interview the Dalai Lama as part of that wow. work. And that was fascinating uh, to travel all the way to Dharamsala mm -hmm. and have an hour with the Dalai Lama. That sounds like it was hugely rewarding. Quite an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, just to get to do, just to get there in the first place. Again, to have that time with him. That's beautiful. So fast forward, how do you balance now as a leader, as a woman, and your kids are getting older, but like a family and a husband and boys, and how do you get it? How do you manage to juggle and get it all done and the support of the husband? So obviously, every parent knows things change depending on the age of your children. Um, but when I was first elected to Congress, I had a three-year-old. And in my first term, I was pregnant with my second child. And so managing a toddler and an infant was very challenging. But uh, in Washington, um, because I was pregnant my first term and because we had a toddler when I was first elected, my husband moved here with me to help because I was, he wasn't going to single parent a yes. toddler and certainly not an infant. So he's like, I'm coming and we'll yeah. do it together. And so we figured it out, but I was lucky enough to have my parents, particularly my mother and my mother-in-law come and s support me uh, when I was uh, pregnant, but also right after I had Henry. And they came for different months at a time to help. And then once Henry was old enough, I was able to get into a daycare center um, that is a congressional daycare center that is subsidized, so it's affordable. And it's one of the reasons why I work so hard on affordable daycare. I'm working right now with Katie Brett on a bipartisan bill to how to increase access to affordable daycare because it's really necessary for women and any parent to be in the workplace to have, number one, their child be in a safe, productive place uh, where they have access to good quality early childhood education and that early socialization. And it allows women to go back to work after whatever leave they may or may not have. Uh, whether they could take leave at all. It's also why I work so hard on national paid leave to make sure states that aren't as progressive as New York could actually have a paid leave plan so parents can um, have that time with their children right after a birth or an adoption. Yeah, not everybody has a grandparent or relatives that can come in and help you. Yes, they don't. And they don't also have time off. And if they aren't high enough wage earner, they have no 
not enough savings to take unpaid leave and they don't have enough savings to even pay for food and housing. So you need to have national paid leave, especially for the lowest wage workers, because they can't take unpaid leave, even if it's guaranteed by the federal government. Yeah. No, no, it makes makes sense. And also just the concept of like, I think especially as women, we recognize that struggle. And so it is also our job or our, you know, opportunity for us to help others because we know how difficult it is. And we know so how much falls on women. It doesn't. It, it's it's just not an even, like you said, your husband wasn't going to stay in, in New York and take care of an infant and a toddler. Was, he wasn't going to happen. So I made sure that my work life could work around my family life and create that balance. But as somebody who runs my own office, I have a lot of authority over what my hours are going to be, yes. when I'll be in the office and when I won't be in the office and what I'll do from home. Um, and so I have a lot more flexibility than the average working parent. Exactly. So. It's one of the reasons why I work so hard on giving flexibility to parents and creating programs that allow them to be good parents and good workers at the same time. It's really important. Thank you. Um, Talk a little bit about like faith. Uh, I mean, I know you're, you're, you're Catholic and it's not about religion, but it's about faith. It's about what it is that you bring to the work you do that could come from what your religion is or from where you, where you believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. So I have a very strong faith and my faith guides me uh, in everything I do. It helps me strengthen my marriage. It helps me be a better parent. Uh, It allows me to um, meet colleagues from all backgrounds, all faiths, all um, ideologies and find common ground. Um, Part of the reason why I chose public service was because I wanted to use all the time and talents that I've been given to make a difference in other people's lives and to help people as my calling. And so it very much informs me. And I, I spend a lot of time with my, my colleagues doing faith related things. We have two Bible studies, one on Tuesday, one on Thursday I go to, and I am one of the co-chairs of the prayer breakfast we have every Wednesday morning. And that is nonpartisan, bipartisan, it's everybody coming together. Yep. And you know, those are things that people in the real world don't know about. Mm-hmm. And I think that they, that sends a message that we're all in this together Mm -hmm. and it doesn't even have to be the same faith, but it's about having that understanding that of who we are spiritually, which is shared, even as different gods or different philosophies. Right. And we, part of the prayer breakfast is to encourage people from different faiths to come and talk about why faith is important to them. So we had our Jewish senators come and share their stories. Uh, We've had. Macy Herrero come, uh, who um, shared her story. And so we're very lucky that we have senators from different backgrounds and different faiths that are willing to come together, break bread, and um, have time to share that personal aspect of their lives with their colleagues. And it, you know, this morning we had Ted Cruz, and um, it was interesting because you'd say, well, what do you, Kirsten Gilbert and Ted Cruz have in common? Well, we're both parents. And Ted talked about his you know, having teenage daughters and one of his daughters is the same age as my son, Henry. And there was so much similarities. And I remembered having Ted and his wife and his two girls over to my house for dinner, probably about maybe seven or eight years ago uh, when they were much smaller. And Henry and Theo played so well with them. And so after his discussion this morning, I said, you know, the next time your family's in DC, please let's plan a dinner so we can get certainly um, his Caroline and my Henry together because they're both 15 year olds going through similar things. Yeah. It's it's not always easy being a daughter or a son of an elected leader, and you get a lot of things imposed upon you that um, are not necessarily comfortable as a teenager. And so I really empathized with a lot of of what he shared today. So uh, there's always common ground to be found. I love that. It's it's a great story. Thank you for sharing it because mm-hmm. it is. When people hear that, they will be like, "What do they have in common?" And you basically said. Humanity, mm-hmm. children, family. And we worked together. Yeah. Ted and I, are, he worked a lot on my military sexual assault bills with me early on. And uh, we're working on public safety bills together I right now. It. So I love it. Um, uh, what do you do when you need to just take a day off? Or not, you don't even have a day off, but to do something for yourself. What do you do to nourish your care for yourself? Well, I like to go to Pilates class or play tennis or play squash or go for a long walk with my dog, Maple. 
What kind of dog is Maple? She's a Labradoodle. Okay. It's very well behaved. And I like to take her when I'm in um, ho- at home in Albany. Um, we have lots of open land around our house. And so she loves to run free without a leash. And she's so happy. But when we're in Washington, there's very few places she's allowed to do that. But one place is the Congressional Cemetery. And in Washington, it's not just a cemetery. It's also a community garden and a dog park. And so um, people join and they bring their dogs and it's great for communities. And actually, I'm taking the women senators next week there to see some of the historic places in the Congressional Cemetery so they can learn about some things that are local that they might not know. I love that. And it's everybody coming together to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a nice field trip. Yeah. Very nice. Um, And... uh, you played squash in college? and in- I did. I played at Dartmouth. And you still play? Yeah. Okay, well, I play tennis, so one day we have to play tennis. I'd love to play okay. tennis. I would love to. Um, and then I also read, just to finish on this subject of exercise, you've run in two marathons? Yeah, in my 20s, so that was quite a while ago. But still, I did it then. Yes. That's still like, very hard. Checked it off the box. You don't have I to do it I did it two anymore. more in a row. So I was very fit, doing lots of long runs. I love that. Knocked it out. I love that. Okay, so now we're going to just switch into like where I'm going to ask you just a few questions or and more like a speed round and you can answer with one word or a few, but um, there's easy, but just for people to get to know who Senator Gillibrand is. So my first question is, what is your favorite sound? I like religious music. I like worship music. That's so nice. if I hear that anywhere, I like it. That's nice. Favorite color? Blue. Blue. Favorite scent or smell? Rose. Wow. Who is your biggest cheerleader? My mother. If you could have one meal, you got a desert island, or they said this is the one meal that you're going to get, what would you choose it to be? Coffee ice cream? That's a meal. Whatever. You're on a desert. You're only going to get one thing and then you're going to die. I would just have a lot of ice cream. I wasn't killing you, but it is coffee ice cream is the best thing. I think it's really special. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) I think it's delicious. Listen, my favorite ice cream. I think it's great. And and it's sort of kind of fulfills that caffeine part too, which is nice. Yeah, I can't have it at night, I realize. Yeah. Can't have it as a That's for breakfast, right? I don't really know when you can have it, but it doesn't work at night. No, I hear you. (laughs) I don't know. I hear you. And a little bit similar is like your favorite music. Is it, is there a certain kind of music that you listen to when you're working? I like female vocalists. And right now I'm almost an expert on Taylor Swift. Very cool. Okay. I have all her albums and I know most of the words to most of her songs. Good. I'm not going to have you sing it. I prepared. I have a 15 year old. We went to the Taylor Swift concert. I had to listen regularly to be prepared for that concert. And I have seen her in the past. I didn't see her in this round, but I heard it. She's great. She's a great entertainer, extremely powerful on stage and capable and very entertaining. And and beautiful words. Yeah. Well, it's interesting about Taylor Swift is that every song is an anthem for someone. And it represents some heartbreak, some tough time, some celebration, something in their life. And what was so interesting about her concert is that it was however many people, like, 50,000 women. It was almost all women. Like there were some men, some young young boys. My son was there. Um, But it was mostly women and they were in tears the whole concert and they all knew every word to every song. So it's, she represents emotions that people have felt and a commonality that is a lived experience, particularly of women in their teens, 20s, 30s. And it's interesting because it's really telling stories and it shows that it doesn't really matter what generation, if you if you can listen to those words, they have meaning all throughout. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, a little plug for Taylor Swift, but it's a natural one because it is beautiful. We like Taylor Swift. Yeah. He's great. Um, when is your favorite household chore? Um, I don't like doing household chores. <laughs> so... I, I'd say that my favorite is cooking for my family. Okay. Um, but I also get tired of that. And the one I l- mind the least that everybody else hates is laundry. Oh. I don't mind doing laundry. Okay. 
and my husband hates it. He's terrible at folding and all those things. So it's so, kind of a good balance. So I'll do the laundry as long as he does the dishes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, good. It works. Um, and what is your, I think everybody has one, well, what is your superpower? Patience. I'm, and I'm a good listener. That is a superpower. These day, this day and age? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's the only reason why I get so much done on a bipartisan basis all the time. Because I listen to, listen to what they want, what they are willing to do, where the commonality lies. And sometimes it takes time to build that. So you need patience. I just passed a bunch of bills in the last two years that some I'd worked on for 12 years. My gun trafficking bill took since 2009 to pass last year. My military sexual assault bill took since 2012. And I had to build allies over time across party lines, different allies to build coalitions. And it eventually got to 65 co-sponsors. We were out, able to outmaneuver the DOD and outmaneuver the chairman of the committees and actually pass a meaningful piece of legislation that took over a decade to pass. Sometimes it's quick, like our um, healthcare for bird pit survivors, um, for members of the military exposed to bird pits. But I, I think that is a superpower. You know, as soon as you think superpowers, it's just things that are just outwardly there. But it is something that is a quality that so few people really do have these days, which is that patience and the willingness to listen. Where, if your family could go somewhere, where would you and all the men in your life, your boys and your husband, go? What would be an ideal vacation? Well, we like to go to Lake Placid because uh, we like going to the mountains and we like hiking and we like quiet places. Um, so our go-to relaxation vacation is somewhere in the Adirondacks. Beautiful. That's not fun. So like a couple hours from perhaps. Yeah. And then is there like a quote or a mantra that you live by that sometimes like you kind of say to yourself the end that it gets you going or that it reminds you of your uh, strength? Mm. So one mantra that we use, especially when we're at a tough time going in a lot of battles and working really hard to do something worthwhile and good is I like this uh, biblical passage about the armor of God. And so I will talk about, which is my chief of staff and I will say armor of God, which means put on your armor of God, which is your, um, it's your breastplate of righteousness. It's your helmet of salvation. It's your um, uh, belt of truth. It's your sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Those are all part of the armor of God. They protect you. And they give you tools to survive difficult times. And also just it's a reminder mm -hmm. because sometimes we do have to bring those things back up. Yeah. And you, it also is a reminder of why I'm here to serve, to help, to make a difference. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to just end on this part, which is we've talked a little bit about it, but I've asked everybody that's been here and people, and this is the beauty of the leaders that I've been able to speak with, very diverse, men and women, different backgrounds, different families came from different parts of the world, different ages. But the one question that I've asked at the end is, what is your definition of joy? What brings you joy? And what does it mean if you have joy that you can then share with others? We have so much negative energy in this world right now. And I'm trying to, through this podcast, spread good energy and spread good stories and share them. But I also think that it's interesting to hear what you, what it means to you, joy. I think joy is rooted in gratitude. And when you're grateful for all the blessings in your life, joy just ensues. Um, it comes from yourself when you realize that you have so many gifts and so many blessings that you have to celebrate them and you have to create praise and deep gratitude for those opportunities and those blessings. And if you're grateful and you show gratitude, I think others feel you it. You are joyful. And you are joyful, but I think others feel it. And, they, and I think joy can spread that way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for coming here. And I'm grateful for you and grateful for your time. And I know being a senator and running for re-election and doing everything that you're doing, it, it's, it's still juggling and the family and everything. And grateful to your staff for helping to put this together. And um, just wishing you only good things and um, I've learned a lot so thank you very much well thank you Liz and thanks for hosting such a great podcast 
Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Ciao.